Hello, good evening and welcome to New Forest Morphs. I'm here with my beautiful daughter Emily, who's our photographer for the evening. And I thought I'd just show you our sticker board to get the evening's video kick started off. And uh, while I do that, Emily, could you zoom in on some of the stickers? I forgot to switch off the fans, I'm just going to switch off the fans. Otherwise it's going to be very noisy. And you can see we've had uh, a lot of support in the last six months. There's a good array of stickers there, isn't there, Emily? <laughs> Have you got a favourite? Uh, maybe. <laughs> God, which is your favourite? Uh, <laughs> Do you like the kilt? Yeah. <laughs> I don't I know my daughter quite well, don't I? Well, we're going to be showing you some different snakes tonight, aren't we, Emily? Yeah. <laughs> Those kind of snakes. So. Someone in Scotland's got quite a wicked sense of humour there. Anyway, tonight I thought we'd just, um, we're going to show some snakes towards the end of the video, which is going to be an update on our beautiful clown clutch. Um, but tonight I thought I would just talk about the need to make small adjustments and this is called the 1% rule. I don't know if you've heard of it before but it was actually something which was introduced uh, several years ago by some of our top um, trainers and the one I'm going to particularly focus on is this chap over here. Emily, can you just focus on this guy here? Do you know who this is? No. Nope. Well, his name is Sir Dave Brailsford and he, unfortunately, he was diagnosed with cancer a couple of years ago. He's still okay and then he had a heart attack and he's having to gently ease out. He's one of the top people in the, in the UK or um, in the British um, Olympics and the Tour de France. He basically took the uh, British um, cycling uh, abilities to the next level and I wanted to draw upon his inspiration tonight to help us to adjust make small adjustments that can make a big difference because by small things great things can be accomplished and so what I wanted to do is just basically give you the backstory to this guy and a little bit of how he came in and the history of the British cycling team going back nearly 60-70 years um, so it's very interesting, you'll probably know that recently the um, British team are doing particularly well uh, in the Olympics and the one in Tokyo this year. We had a record number of gold medals from the Olympic British team, more so than any other country in the world. But that wasn't always the case. You know, Many years ago um, we weren't that successful with the British cycling team and uh, they kept on bringing in new trainers, new people to try to change things to get the British uh, cycling ability on the map but unfortunately the, some of the trainers weren't actually taking the right approach until Dave came along and he came up with a very small simple approach which I'm going to share with you now there's a, a video that I've been watching over this weekend that shares his story and how it impacts on how well the British team do and I think we can take some inspiration from that and we'll talk about making some small adjustments in our facilities to help us to have a more successful beginning to the new season ahead. So I think we can take some inspiration from that and then we'll talk about some specifics of what little adjustments we can make that can make a huge difference. So let's start with this video and see if we can get it up. And it's called 1% One per Better by a guy called Michael A. Dunn. And let's see whether we can get that to uh, go off the widescreen. For more than a century, the national bicycle racing teams of Great Britain had been the laughing stock of the cycling world. Mired in mediocrity, British riders had managed only a handful of gold medals in a hundred years of Olympic competitions, and had been even more underwhelming in cycling's marquee event, the three-week-long Tour de France, where no British rider had prevailed in a hundred and ten years. Now, so sorry was the plight of British riders that some bike manufacturers refused to even sell bikes to the Brits, fearing it would forever sully their hard-won reputations. And despite devoting enormous resources into cutting-edge technology and every newfangled training regimen, nothing worked. Well, nothing that is until 2003, 
when a small, largely unnoticed change occurred that would forever alter the trajectory of British cycling. That new approach would also reveal an eternal principle with a promise regarding our oft times perplexing mortal quest to improve ourselves. So what happened in British cycling that has great relevance to our personal pursuit to be better daughters and sons of God? Well, in 2003, Sir Dave Brailsford was hired. And unlike previous coaches who attempted dramatic overnight turnarounds, Sir Brailsford instead committed to a strategy he referred to as the aggregation of marginal gains. Now, this entailed implementing small improvements in everything. That meant constantly measuring key statistics and training targeting specific weaknesses. It's somewhat akin to the prophet Samuel the Lamanite's notion of walking circumspectly. Now, this broader, more holistic view avoids the trap of being myopically fixated on just the obvious problem or sin at hand. Said Brailsford, the whole principle came from the idea that if you broke down everything you could think of that goes into riding a bike and then improve it by just 1%, you will get a significant increase when you put them all together. Okay, right, Emily. <laughs> so that's the beginning of the talk. So he talks about this principle of actually making small adjustments to make a big impact. So what I thought I'd do is um, learn from last year's breeding successes and some of our challenges. And I made a list of all the different things that we can adjust in our um, facilities or in our breeding plans. And the kind of things that we can adjust are humidity, temperatures, bedding, hides, water quality, food quality, size, timing and presentation, nutrients and vitamins, airflow, air quality, <coughs> excuse me, talk about air quality, sorry, <laughs> yeah. um, thermostat controls, um, humidity controls, cleaning products, disinfectants and antiseptics, gloves, sterilization, choice of reptile vet, um, preventative medicines, cures and remedies, um, things like light cycles and light quality, um, choosing a mentor, someone that can guide us, someone that's experienced, somebody that can give us really good information that will help adjust us and maybe be lovely enough to correct us when we need to be corrected. Um, and I'm grateful that I have some great mentors out there that help me adjust. Then we've got things like quarantine, how, what can we do better in our quarantine areas to uh, prevent disease entering our collections? There's other things like marketing, sales, shipping, logos, multimedia, a name. Now we know Justin Kabelka has just recently announced his change of name. He's no longer Justin Kabelka. He's called himself Kinova, which I think is a fantastic name. And I think a lot of us have got mixed feelings because we associate Justin Kabelka as uh, a leading example for us hobbyists coming up and breeders to be able to learn so much from him he's so inspiring but I think he's teaching us that uh, change is a good thing and if it, for him it's time to make a change and it, although it may feel a little bit uncomfortable just to start with I believe in the long term this change will be a fantastic uh, decision that he's made and I suspect there could be a much more global market and going into um, lots of other areas where he's really backing his team and not focusing on his own name, even though his name will always be associated with credibility. So I think it's really beautiful. And of course, Kinova, when I try to work out the meaning, Kin family, Nova, is a growing star that gets brighter. But then Justin's put out a video recently explaining that he's changed his name because he sees um, Kin Nova is K, his first initial, Innova Innovative. So he's got some really interesting ideas and he's been using top marketing consultants to help him rebrand his um, company. So we wish you well with that, but we can take inspiration from that. The other things we're going to look at are using the right suppliers, making sure we home in on the right discounts and get the right quality of products, equipment and snakes. We're going to be looking at making adjustments in our planning, in our projecting, in our accounting. We're going to be looking at making adjustments in our priorities and prioritizing correctly. We'll be looking at staffing and training. We'll be looking at recording our reptile development. So in other words, we'll be using things like reptile scan to help us record what the animals are doing. 
Um, there's other things that we can do, like for example, um, looking at the quality of the racks that we're using, the rubs, looking at the other things. Jared and I have just bought an ultrasound that's coming in a couple of weeks. We've decided to use the ultrasound to help us protect our males and to be able to home in on what the females are actually doing so that we can use our males very carefully at the right time when the eggs or follicles are growing that we can introduce them at the right time to make us more effective and to protect our animals. And we will be sh sharing a video on that when it arrives and we'll probably do a few demonstrations and show you the, uh, the benefits of having that in, in your facility. Now it's not 100% necessary to have it but these are small adjustments that you make that may not seem significant in their own but when you amalgamate them together it can make a huge impact and we're going to come back to the analogy of the bikes the bicycle adjustments that were made to get us from being quite low in the world to top of the world in the bicycling um, competitive worldwide um, competitions and there are other things we can look at uh, obviously heat mats incubators boxes and substrates we can look at things like um, covering when we're away on holiday things like socialization which Emily's our expert she knows how to socialize these animals when to socialize with them and when not to handle them things like enrichment time how can we give our snakes enrichment time to make sure that they're in a good mental state um, and we've got some ideas there uh, so there's lots and lots of things that we can discuss and lots of things that we're going to be looking to do and we'll probably do it over the course of 12 months where we're homing on one of those topics and if anyone out there would like us to cover a particular topic uh, that you feel would be beneficial please do feel free to drop a comment in the box below so these are some of the adjustments that we're looking at so before we go on to our specific plans I'm going to revert back to the video and just share you with you the um, next stage of making these small adjustments and we can draw upon this as well so let's see if I can find the next part I want to share with you so just go up a little bit more perfect that's just five pages a day or another manageable goal for your situation could aggregating small but steady marginal gains in our lives finally be the way to victory over even the most pesky of our personal shortcomings? Can this bite-sized approach to tackling our blemishes really work? Well, acclaimed author James Clear says this strategy puts the math squarely in our favor. He maintains that habits are the compound interest of self-improvement. If you can get just 1% better at something each day, by the end of a year, you will be 37 times better. Now, Brailsford's small gains begin with the obvious, such as equipment, kit fabrics, and training patterns. But his team didn't stop there. They continued to find 1% improvements in overlooked and unexpected areas, such as nutrition and even maintenance nuances. Over time, these myriad of micro-betterments aggregated into stunning results which came faster than anyone could have imagined. Truly, they were onto the eternal principle of line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Well, will little adjustments work that mighty change that you desire? Properly implemented, I'm 99% certain they will. But the one caveat with this approach is that for small gains to aggregate, there must be a consistent day in and day out effort. And although we likely won't be perfect, we must be determined to mirror our persistence with patience. Okay, so there's a couple of interesting points there. So Sir Dave brought in lots of small adjustments, which was like clothing they were using, the type of bikes, the technology in the bikes, the nutrition of the athletes, the training, the effort, the patience, and he wasn't looking at making massive adjustments all in one hit. It was small incremental adjustments over time with effort lead to big things. Now Justin Kabelka is a good example of this because he talks about making small adjustments to his morphs. He goes for high intensity orange dream rather than a low intensity. He goes for the very best of what he can find and then he mixes those palettes to produce even better animals with line breeding and other techniques and I think we can learn a lot from the top breeders and what I wanted to do in our 12 month series for the new season is home in on small adjustments which won't be onerous on us it means that we might have to spend 
a little bit more focus, a little bit more time on particular areas or maybe do a little bit more research, bring in perhaps some new equipment if we need to, whatever you want to do. But I think my plan is to try to get our facility in the very best state that we can for the benefit of the animals and the fruit that will come off those animals. So just to finalise his final remarks, I'll just share another 30 seconds of his summing up of this principle. Let's see if we can find that. There we go. Just get the chance to go. This pocket-sized approach to repentance and real change really work? Is the proof in the peddling, so to speak? Well, consider what's happened to British cycling in the past two decades since implementing this philosophy. British cyclists have now won the story Tour de France an astonishing six times. During the past four Olympic Games, Great Britain has been the most successful country across all cycling disciplines. And in the recently concluded Tokyo Olympics, the UK won more gold medals in cycling than any other country. But far outshining worldly silver or gold, our precious promise down our roadway to the eternities is that we will indeed triumph in Christ. And as we commit to making small but steady improvements, we are promised a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Okay, so obviously this particular speaker is drawing a spiritual parallel. Um, but I want to also draw a parable to every aspect of our lives, whether it's our work, our family, whether it's the facilities that we run, um, whether it's our own well-being inside, is that small adjustments can make a huge impact on our lives. So just to sum up the video, um, we are going to cover a couple of technology things over the next couple of videos, which will be using the reptile scan to improve our recording of the snakes, and we'll jazz in the process of getting all the barcodes and we'll do a demonstration of that. When the ultrasound arrives, Emily, we're going to do demonstrations of how to use the products and bring in our snakes, actually check some of the follicle sizes, some of the big girls, because I only want to put the males to them at the right time and I want to use technology to help us. But just to finish this video, Emily and I have decided to share a couple of our baby hatchlings that fed on Wednesday, so they're completely digested and it's an update on our clown clutch. So should we go and have a look at those, Emily, and see mm -hmm. how they're doing? Right. Talking of adjustments, I've actually increased the humidity levels to 70%. Have you noticed that, Emily? Yeah. And I'm finding that, in actual fact, when I did some further research, the, they say that 70% humidity is quite typical in the parts of Africa where the bull pythons come from. So although I was saying between 60 and 65 is pretty optimal, we're finding that by just lifting it slightly more, we've got an amazing feeding instinct this feeding from Friday. I mean, I've never seen the girls come out and the boys come out with so much ferocity. So the humidity will also unlock the feeding of animals. It makes them feel a lot better. They like to feel that they're in a right environment, more moist than perhaps we've given them over the past. And this small adjustment, we're gonna experiment and see how it impacts on their well-being and their feeding and how they shared and I know that uh, one of our mentors which is Rob at uh, Royal Bulls he has a natural um, tropics he lives in the tropics so he's tell he told us that he's got 80% humidity in his facility which is a natural uh, tropical humidity and he says he doesn't spend a lot of time in there because it gets so hot and sweaty in there but I think it's interesting because a lot of the breeders around the world recommend an ambient humidity of 60 to 65 but I think the reality is um, there isn't an exact pinpoint and Rob was saying that it's it's based on the mixture between temperature and humidity does affect how much moisture is in the air so it all depends on the tempers that temperatures that you're running that affects the amount of humidity in the air as well so it's a fine balance and you have to home in on your local climate to work out what's best for you. So I don't think there is a right answer because Bob, uh, Rob's very happy with his 80% and it's working for him, very successful. We wish you well, Rob, on your eggs are pipping at this moment in time and we're really looking forward to seeing the outcome and also enjoying your new series, which is Geared Up For Beginners, which we are looking forward to because I think it will help us as well being in the hobby just a couple of years. So thank you for that. So how much time do we have, Emily? 
It's been recording for 20 minutes. So, five minutes of snake time, shall we do that? Sure. So, do you want to show off the clowns, Emily, and I do the filming in the light box? Should we sure. do that? Just yeah. Don't get me. I won't get you, don't worry, I'll get the snakes. <laughs> Where are the clowns? So, the clowns are just down here. So, let's start with Linnea. Now, why don't we also weigh them before they go in the light box as well? See how they're doing. So there's Linnea, she's an absolute pistol, you can see, but she's really, <laughs> Gonna she bite just me. wants to be fed, doesn't she? Yeah. So let's just weigh and see how she's weighing in. So how much does she weigh, Emily? 153. 153 grams. So she went from 85 about, or probably born about eight weeks ago, and she's just about doubled her weight now. Now look how beautiful she is. Now she's in a defensive mode. But I think she's just looking absolutely smashing, Emily. Just look how beautiful she is. Mm. You might have to use a bit of tissue when you uh, pick her up because I think she's probably thinking it's food feeding time, but it isn't. I don't mind. <laughs> isn't she just lovely though? Do you like her a lot, Emily? Is she yeah, one of your favourites? I'll just see if I can zoom in without getting... Come on, Emily, just do the business for us. That's it. She's got a lovely head stamp, isn't she? And just look at the patterns on her. Really, really beautiful. Right, okay. So that is Linnea. So she was the first one to eat. She ate within a day of coming out of her shed. And then the next one we've got is Ezekiel, 177. So we've got three visuals and two hets from a, uh, a butter het clown to a clown. So we beat the odds. Let's weigh him in first. So this is Ezekiel. Let's see how he's doing. What's 98. His? 98. And let's have a look and see what he looks like in the light box. He's hiding his head. Is he hiding his head? Oh look, he's coming out though. Let's have a little zoom in on him and see how he's doing. He's lovely, isn't he lovely? So he's got an upside down horseshoe on his head, which his sister, called Lucky, has the same horseshoe as well. And he's doing really well. He was the, it took him three weeks to start eating from shedding. So that's why he's smaller than his sister. But we'll let Emily put him back now and then we'll get out his sister, which is Lucky. See how she's doing. She's probably in between the two of them, I think, Emily. quite late as well. I mean that's another thing about handling animals, you're probably better off handling them during the day. 130. She's 130 so she's doing really well. Let's see what she looks like in the light box. Sorry. There we go. Oh she's lovely. She's one of my favourite looking animals. I just love the way she looks. And she's nicely positioned. Coiled. And she's got lovely markings on her. And it's lovely when you see the hatchling starting to put on a little bit of weight. And you start to see their patterns more clearly and their colours. And I can't see her horseshoe because she's got her head up. It's quite hard to see the horseshoe on the back of her head, but um, it's definitely there. And I think she's absolutely one of my favourite snakes, hatchlings, hold back for this year. So I've got some big plans for these female clowns going forwards. So thank you Emily. And then we'll have a quick look at the hets as well, shall we? There's two hets that we've also produced. One's a butter het clown boy called Zach. He's on number 180 Emily on the right hand side, just over there. And again he's probably wanting to... <laughs> Yeah, Jared did say that he's... he's... twice already. <laughs> I'll tell you what, let's leave him, Emily, let's leave him. <laughs> okay, I think... The they best... all of them. Yeah, I think the best thing is that we'll bring them out during the daytime, because yeah. night time they think it's feeding time. Feeding time. Yeah. You can have a little look at the one other one that we've got here, which is... Um, which one was I going to have a look at? Um, should we have a quick look at the two banana spider head clowns, see how they're doing? Yeah, see how they're doing. Yeah. 
be a little bit more docile. <laughs> Look, he's but nice. Zach is fiery, isn't he? <laughs> At least he's hungry. Yeah. So how how big do you think this one's mm, doing? Sure. 137. 137. Let's have a look at him under the spotlight. And we've um, popped both of them. They're both boys. And that came from a female banana. So it would have been 50-50 chance. But there you go. There's the banana spider 100% het for clown. And there he comes. There's a lovely head stamp there. So beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful head stamps. And the spiders are very similar looking on the head to clowns. But I think the head clown is definitely having an influence on them. And he's on a little bit of a walkabouts. So, there we go. And do you want to put the um, the other one in as well, Emily? Okay. The brother, yeah, Harry Bird. Wait. Put them in together. Just remember which is which. <laughs> Try. We'll weigh him first and then just see how much he weighs. See if they're similar weights. So that one is... 130. So they're virtually identical weights. Yeah, if we put them together as a pair. That's lovely. There we go. A pair of bananas. <laughs> there we go. Beautiful head stamp on them. Losing one. I think one of them is on runabouts, but that's okay. Let's home in on this one. Look at the head stamp, isn't that just beautiful? And look, he's showing those lovely yellow in the eyes. And look at the head stamp on that, isn't that just unbelievable? I, which ones I think <laughs> yeah, Emily will rescue them both on there runabouts. Yeah. Oh, she's gone under. She's gone under? Oh, well, they've both gone under. Just one. Yeah. Why don't you show me them under the under the other light over here, Emily? Let's go over here and see them under here. Oh, there we go. That's lovely. There's your pair. So really, really beautiful. Well, thank you, Emily, for joining us tonight and for sharing those lovely babies with us. That's all right. I hope everyone's enjoyed a little bit of eye candy to finish off, and um, we wish everyone a lovely end to their weekend. Hope everyone's having a great time with the breeding season. Back to Emily. So it's goodbye from Emily. And goodbye. Goodbye from me. Thank you for your support and love and we will catch up with you hopefully midweek and uh, I say fingers crossed that we get the scan coming soon and also we get the reptile scan so we'll bring in more technology in and just to sum up small adjustments by small the small adjustments bring about great things and that's the thought for the evening. Have a lovely weekend and we'll see you soon. Bye bye for now.